Hey everybody, this is Jessica Henry Gray and we have a great little video for you this week. I am going to be painting a beautiful forest creek and I'm really excited for that. But first and quickly, I just wanted to let you know about two study opportunities that might interest you. Um, first of all, I will be returning to southern France this summer, this year, 2023, to put on a painting plein air workshop at Les Vieux Cavant. Uh, during the days, we travel and we paint beautiful, amazing scenes of medieval towns and quaint villages and a gorgeous lavender field. In the evening, the staff at Les Vieux prepares our meal and the food last summer was some of the best I have ever had. Um, and you can buy their cookbook. So you can get more information by clicking the link above or in the description section below of this video. Another study option much closer to home is a subscription to my study program on Epiphany Fine Art. I'm building a library of videos on a wide variety of subjects such as drawing, plein air and portraiture, drawing animals and so much more. The part I enjoy most about Epiphany is the question and answer sessions with my Epiphany subscribers. So each month we talk about topics that are important to us as artists and I do my best to answer your questions and do some critiques and I try to fit in a short demonstration. The cost for subscription is $35 a month so it doesn't cost very much to try it out and improve your art. Again, click on the link above to learn some more. And finally, to stay up on everything that's going on, sign up for my newsletter. Either click the link above or see the description below. All right, let's get going on this video. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Jessica Henry Gray and I'm really happy to have you with me today. Today I'm going to demonstrate painting this river little creek in um, this beautiful canyon forested area. So thank you so much for joining me and let's jump in. On my palette today, I have titanium white, cadmium yellow medium, and cadmium yellow deep, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, burnt umber, ultramarine blue, phthalo green, and phthalo blue, and alizarin permanent. I have also off to the side over there, um, cobalt green and emerald green. And I'm just using those for mixing up some of the different shades of green. They're not mandatory to have on your palette, but um, I do like to have some extras in case I am just not able to get the exact transparent shade of green that I'm looking for. So I've got my linseed oil and um, a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. And what I'm doing here is I'm just taking a little bit of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and I'm and some thinner and I'm mapping out my composition. I did do my thumbnail sketch. I apologize for not showing it. Um, I just, I had limited time, so I got, I jumped right into the painting. But you can see here as I work out the composition that um, it, this is my, basically my thumbnail sketch as you can see it developing here on the canvas. So I'm establishing my focal area with that value contrast that I talked about um, earlier about that uh, when selecting a scene, look for something that's a visual interest and that is going to hold the viewer, you know, like that little cave that where this water just flows back to is just really interesting. And there's a nice contrast element too. So that is my focal area. And I'm putting it in the upper kind of third, two thirds of the canvas. Now I added a, a bit of the cadmium yellow to, and some a little bit of blue to the sky to just establish that light in the event that the lighting is going to change, which everybody who's planner painted knows it's going to change. And so I am working on just getting some of those passages where that beautiful transparent light is showing up. Now what I want to show you here is off to the right side of my canvas. It, that whole passage of the scene before me is a cooler passage. It's not getting the direct sunlight as the sun was coming in a, a little bit from that right hand corner. So that whole right side of the palette is going to be, or canvas is going to be more in shadow. And then on that left side where I'm just kind of wiping is going to be a little bit cooler under the bushes, but the top are going to be getting some warm, nice lights. Now, I'm taking a, a rag here and I'm wiping off some of the slick surface of the thinner just because I'm blocking in these massive uh, value shapes. I don't want a lot of slick surface on the canvas with the thinner. So I'm satisfied with that 
um, those color blockings and those value blockings as I go along. I'm going to take a little smaller brush now and go through and just draw out my design. Now here I'm taking some cadmium yellows and a little bit of blue and I'm pushing that uh, glow again just to really get that uh, extreme color that I see in there. You can see with the corner of my brush I just grabbed the tiniest bit of yellow ochre because I wanted a slightly bit more neutral green to this and some other passages I'll pop in some brighter um, greens. Don't be afraid to use a little bit of yellow to intensify some of those. It will cool it down a little, the white will, but that's okay because it is further back and so a little bit of coolness in there is appropriate. So putting it in where I see it because they're color notes and I'm thinking about it as like as music notes as they trickle down through the canvas getting closer to the viewer and that light in the trees and the sky is also reflected in the water. And every now and then the sun would come out and just create that beautiful reflection. And so I tried to grab that when I'd see it. And that's what you have to do with things when clouds pass over the sun or it, all of a sudden it gets overcast. Try to grab those elements that really do create that um, effect that you're looking for. Now over here where these mossy rocks are a little bit closer to us and in more of the shade of under that bush, I'm adding more blues and yellow ochres to create sort of a, an olive tone to these mossy rocks because where they are also in the sunlight, that becomes that brighter spring green. And then of course my dark passages under the rocks as they um, kind of hover over the water. That is just ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna. And then I'm grabbing the green and just gently pulling it down into the dark to soften the edges a little. Um, taking a little bit more of that green and figuring out where these darker passages are under the bush. I haven't put the bush in yet, but um, it's creating a shadow in the water as well. Now I've taken some um, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and without cleaning my brush off I used the greens that were in it already to mix up some of that um, sort of brownish green that's in the water. And you can do that sometimes knowing what's in your brush um, and using it to help you create different colors. And if you need to clean your brush do so but sometimes just having a knowledge of what is going on will help you to become more efficient and you can economize your paint on your palette as well by using some of the colors that you already have mixed for other colors.
So I want to point out here as I'm working on this taupe color, um, it's sort of a yellow ochre, burnt sienna and some white mixture. It, when you're working on a passage like that back there where it, there's a lot of overwhelming information, I, I would say try to go to the furthest background you can. I don't mean in the sky, but I mean as we're working on that taupe colored foliage with the grass above it and the ferns and whatever. Look for, okay, first the shadows, then the ground sort of color, and then the bush color on top of that, and then we'll put the highlights on top of that. So that's how I work through some of those more complicated passages where I see a lot of colors and it can be overwhelming. Um, so just be very intentional and block in colors as you see them. And I also, like back there in that background, I had that taupe color, um, but then it, it quickly switched to greens and all of the different varieties. So while I had that beautiful taupe, I put it elsewhere where I saw. And um, that's why uh, one of the ways you can be efficient and economize your palette too, is when you have the color mixed, just squint and see where else you um, can put it. If it's on your brush and you've got a little pile of it, just keep it moving.
Now in this passage here, there are a lot of different shades of brown and I'm keeping them very subtle in their value and color shifts um, as I'm working on that passage with the, um, I, I'll add a little bit more sienna, a little bit more blue, a little bit more white or some olive into that mixture. Here I'm starting to work on a cooler blue with a little bit of green. Surrounding the glowing light, um, I'm gonna use a little bit more of the non-color. And you can see from the photo reference that it is that it's cooler off to the side of the banks and because it's not getting the warm sunlight. So I'm pushing that kind of a more darker chalky sage, which is the ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, and some white, maybe a little cadmium, not much. Um, to get that beautiful shady green. And I'll do it on the other side too. You notice bright color when there's absence of color. So in this context, keeping everything else a dollar neutral will create that visual tunnel for that golden glow. And I'll, I'll do that with even a still life or whatever, uh, whatever you're painting. If you want a passage to look lit up, darken the area around it a little bit more or you know, neutralize some of the color if you want it to, something to look really colorful. I would say it's like the one black diamond on a velvet pillow. Or I'm sorry, the one diamond on a black velvet pillow. You notice it because there's nothing else competing with it. But if you put, you know, a hundred diamonds on a brightly colored pillow, you know, all of a sudden you're not going to appreciate the beauty and the splendor of that one diamond on that black pillow. So it's sort of a way to think about when you're creating your focal area, the lead in through the creek and then the glowing spot in the distance, that's your one diamond on the velvet pillow. So everything else has to be second to that one spot. Now here I'm working on the gravel that is the gravel and rocks that are closer to me. There's a bit of more of a warmth to the um, the ground and the rocks that I'm looking at. You can see it even down in the reference picture. It's it's fallen leaves. It's there's rocks underneath. So I'm making sure that I have a little bit more yellow ochre and burnt sienna in the things that are closer to me. So further back, I'll lessen the amount of yellow ochre and burnt sienna and and keep it a little bit more gray um, with the blue and the brown and white as it goes further back. So some of the light is hitting some of these um, leaves and passages around the rocks. So I'm establishing the background first and then I'll build it up with rocks and things as it gets um, sort of closer to the, me, the viewer. So here I'm establishing a foundation in the background of my water and then into that I will add some variations of some darks and lights as the stones and, and things are sort of layered on top. But I always begin, like I've um, said before, with the furthest background element, which in this case back there is the water and then the rocks on top. So the water's further back, 
and then we lay the rocks on top. Reflections are part of water. And so get those in as you're blocking in the colors and values and shapes that you see in the water's reflections. And then you can take and like I'm doing here, just lay some dark passages for rocks and shadows, whatever. They fall on top of the water. And so that's what I'm working on in this area. Uh, now I'm realizing at the beginning of this video, I don't, I don't recall if I mentioned that that darker color in between ultramarine blue and burnt sienna is actually burnt umber. I don't, I don't know if I mentioned that or not. That is a, I, if I need to get, um, if I have a scene where I have a lot of grays and a few really dark darks, then I might throw on a little bit of burnt umber because I use it to make some really lovely shades of gray. And um, you can see every now and then I grab it to get with the ultramarine blue and make almost jet black if I need it. And so here I'm establishing a pattern of rocks in the background. Now those rocks are not going to stay looking like that. I don't like to create like dab, 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 dabs of rocks. I want the rock to feel like it's part of the stream and not just like a thing. And <laughs> so I will put a mark to indicate where I want it to go, but I'll come back and give it a little um, highlight and soften the bottom where it goes into the water just so that it doesn't stand out like I, I don't know a lily pad a black lily pad sitting on the water surface um, in the background there the rocks are kind of it looks like they're drifting all the way across the river the little creek and so I've extended that sandbar rock bar whatever all the way across and so now I'm giving the information back there just a little bit more finesse before moving ahead. Now that little swipe that I did down in the water, those are actually the, what you see above is the, um, those little cascading ivy things that are hanging over the cave. And so it's a reflection down in the water. And just going through, and I'm adding those now on the surface, all of those reflections to create the movement of water because we see movement of water just on the surface. So when you've got all of your watercolors <laughs> blocked in, you know where you're going with that, then you add those water reflections and movements on the surface. All right, now here I am hooking my finger on the side of my canvas to help steady my hand. What I'm doing here, when I mentioned earlier about painting rocks, this is sort of a technique that I use where I just want a little bit of a highlight on the top. And so it helps me to stay steady my hand if I lock my pinky down <laughs> on the edge. 
and it's just an interesting technique that you can use if your hands are a little bit shaky. Um, and so now I'm placing the rocks, thinking about them as a compositional element. And so intentionally placing them where they're going to best suit my needs and lead the viewer back into the painting and you know, just kind of skip jump around in the creek and provide a service <laughs> uh, leading the viewer. Now what I'm doing here is I've got a little bit lighter background of the forest colors and foliage and I'm adding some darker foliage to the top to reflect the trees that are just a little closer to us. So I've taken just some clean white at this point and chiseled the edge of the brush as much as possible. And I'm dragging it, sort of scumbling it along the surface of the canvas, letting it dance and scrape and juggle around where you can see it from the reference picture where the water creates that movement. And I don't wanna overdo it because it would be easy to add too much and then I've lost some of the information that's under the surface of the water. So I have to be careful to uh, select where these pieces of information are going to best suit my needs for this painting. 
So again, just some of those whites were a little bit more neutral and in the shadow, and some show up a little brighter, more crisp as they come into the light more. So adding a little more uh, white to it and carefully choosing. Sometimes I'll put a piece down and I'll wipe it out because it's too strong, too big, too bright, whatever. And uh, you just have to make those choices as you're going. Now what I'm doing here is I'm illustrating with the brush brushwork just how to create a little bit of movement in the water further back. And I'm making sure to keep my zigzags in the water tighter the further back they go. What that means is if you're if you imagine them like drawing a Z, the Z gets more squashed the further back it goes from our line of sight. Up close, it's more like a fatter W. It, you know drawing it from the side you've got um, because you're looking down on the ripples and they're more of a swoop further back they're a scrunched Z so I hope that that helps with that uh, I also wanted to thank you for watching this video I hope that if you have any questions you feel free to ask and um, all I'm doing here to wrap up this scene is just to go through and Make sure that all of my darks ha have some air to them, a little bit of cool, a little bit of um, shadowy uh, coolness, dampness into them. And I'm also going through and just adding a few more bits of information that I think it needed. And that is pretty much it for this painting. We've got a glare on the canvas now, so I guess that's time to wrap it up. <laughs> So you guys enjoy this and I hope you got something from it. Be sure to ask if you have any questions. I'm always happy to help as best I can. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right, everybody. Well, that wraps this up. Thank you so much for joining me and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.